if there's ever a time where we needed to pull together as believers of Christ and, and unite and try to strengthen and make the world a better place, it's now. Mm-hmm. And that, that sounds like he's yeah. preaching our message. <laughs> there's one body, one church, one spirit, one hope. The realities of the faith, the ra- realities that unify us are already there. Christ prayed for unity. What should we be praying for? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the one prayer request of Jesus. Think about it in the Bible that we actually have a say in whether or not it comes to fruition or not. I think in what God has done in you guys in uh, in this podcast and the, the multitude of folks that you're reaching, the diversity, whatever God intended when, he's, when you started this, he's able to bring it to completion. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Whole Church Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Joshua Noel, here with your other co-host, TJ Tiberius Von Blackwell. Hello. And also with our special guest, Pastor C.T. Kirk, who um, I'll say, I say pastor, he's also author and um, teacher mm-hmm. and uh, what else? I, th- I think you're doing a sitcom of some sort. I couldn't possibly tell you all the great things that C.T. is up to, but uh, do you, you prefer uh, Pastor C.T. or Pastor Kirk or what would you prefer to go by? Uh, C.T. is great. All right. Awesome, awesome, man. Awesome. Yeah. So we're really excited to talk to him about everything he's up to, his church and I'm, I'm sure he's going to surprise us with even more things he does that I don't know about. But great speaker, great guy. Uh, before we do, I want to review some of what our audience has been up to. Uh, we've actually had five new people sign up for our newsletter. Wow. Yeah, yeah, just in the last month. So that's really cool. If you want to join them, just email us at thewholechurch at gmail.com. Let us know you want to join them, and we'll include you in that newsletter. Um, also, uh, we had a review coming from TJ Snapchat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, I have a lot of friends that I've never actually met, you know, just online friends. And uh, my friend Harrison started listening to the podcast recently. And uh, today he texted me. He was like, hey, I listened to another episode of the podcast. It was just supposed to be until I went to sleep, uh, you know, just to put me to sleep. Uh, <laughs> but I, I accidentally listened to the whole thing or to at least half of it. So, you know, good job. Yeah, so, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, so at least we're doing we're doing good enough to keep keep someone away for half an hour. So that, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. And then uh, also want to just mention my favorite of the responses we got to last week's silly question about who you would slime in all of history, Nickelodeon style. Uh, TJ's mom, uh, Miss Dawn, she said Hitler. I like that answer because it doesn't matter what time you pick to slime Hitler. Any time during his career would have been a funny time to slime Hitler. Also, he deserved it. So, yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Awesome. So, with that being said, we're going to jump into today's silly question. Uh, Pastor CT, me and TJ will answer first. Give you time to think about it. All right. Okay. We always do a silly question, just kind of break the ice, kind of help everybody get comfortable. And because uh, honestly, at this point, it's just fun. Yeah. <laughs> We've been doing it for so long. So uh, today is if you could invent any one snow cone play, any anything for a snow cone. Uh-huh. What would it be? I, I would like TJ to go first because okay. snow cones are kind of his arena. So, like, it's Italian. I would prefer Italian ice to snow cones, but that's okay. The problem with this question is that, like, basically every flavor already exists. So I'm going to pick clouds. <laughs> I don't, I'm, there's no way a cloud tastes good. But, you know, if you could taste a cloud as a snow cone, well, you know, it might be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I have the same problem with the question normally. You know, most flavors it taken so i went with what, what i'm certain would be an awful flavor if it doesn't exist i would invent a gravy flavored snow cone uh, specifically turkey gravy flavored mm. yeah i'm still on my thanksgiving yeah. kick i can't help it that does sound awful yeah but I, i'd probably still enjoy it i don't think anybody else would though. Mm. all right yeah all right so um pastor ct if you could choose Invent any one snow cone flavor, what would it be? Um, since I'm a, a fan of shrimp boat chicken and Rock Hill, I'm gonna have to say uh shrimp boat wings with the extra seasoning. Mm. All right. That would definitely be a new flavor. <laughs> <laughs> On ice. Um, I don't know, man. I just I would try it. But man. They've already then you know, they've already pretty much figured out every good flavor, so. Yeah, that, that's just true. Unless we try them all out. Who knows? Anyway. Yeah. Good answer, though. Probably. <laughs> better than a cloud. I don't know. I would try it. Yeah. Definitely better than a <laughs> But uh, So one thing we believe is extremely important to church unity 
is to hear one another's story of how we came to Christ. Uh, would you mind telling us your testimony? All right. So my testimony basically surrounds um, my mother got saved when I was a very young child and really introduced us to church. And through that introduction, I just kind of fell in love with the whole church structure. I fell in love with Jesus. I fell in love with the whole church experience. And I remember at a young age, just accepting the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as my personal savior. Um, then started growing up and really started wanting to be a teenager, wanting to kind of be normal because the majority of kids that I grew up around were not into church and so wanted to kind of follow that crowd kind of led me out of the church and wanted to live a more secular life and then um you know but mother never took her hand off of the whole you going to church regardless of what you want to do you know and so really just around 18 years old really just recommit myself to the purpose and the destiny that the lord had over my life and kind of been running ever since just strong for god awesome great great man yeah, we, we just love um, a, lot, a lot of people have that kind of testimony where, you know, it was from even from a young age, you know, just getting introduced to God, which I think it's an important testimony as, um, you know, a lot of people feel like their story isn't good enough because, you know, they didn't have all these things happening. You know, usually we hear these you when know, someone comes up and tells their testimony. A lot of times you know, it's, it's a grand thing of yeah. they got delivered from drugs and all this stuff. And it's important to know that no matter what your story is, it's an important story because it's a story that God saw fit to have you go through and to have you share. So I, I think that's great. And it also reminds us of the importance of um, ministering to our children, which I think is phenomenal. Right. Um, didn't want to ask you, what denomination are you a part of, Pastor? Um, we're not denominational. Right. Wow, so that, that's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gives, you, gives, you, gives you the opportunity to be able to fellowship with um, diverse, diverse um, denominations and, and people of um, different different kind of beliefs as far as doctrine and um, and denomination. Right, which we're a big fan of here uh, on the Whole Church Podcast. Yeah. Your favorite church unity podcast. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah we like the Whole Church, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's great, dude, though. Um, so what could you tell us uh, about your church or what's unique about you guys? Uh, what's unique about our church is our church is pretty much um, a community driven church. We are big in the community and believe in being that voice for the community. Um, our church was actually founded on the uh, helping of a homeless person when uh, me and nine minister friends of mine decided that we were going to shadow a homeless person for one night and going under the bridge and sleeping under the bridge and experiencing those cold, that cold weather really prompted us to say, you know what, this is something that we want to do. We want to be a church that ministers to the needs of our community. And so we've been really, really engulfed in community driven work and our church um, in the 11 years that it's been um, a church has served over 300 different community incentives within our community. Wow. Yeah, no, I see that stuff. Um, and I follow you guys on Facebook and stuff, man. I see a lot of uh, just different things you're doing with uh, just the Rock Hill community, you know. And um, I help with a few, few different other things. And you know, I know I noticed you're very involved. I, I think you're actually you run the What's Up Rock Hill Facebook group, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, man, that's that's awesome. I love to see churches get involved like that. It's great. Cool, cool. Uh, so one thing we like to do just to help us and our audience become more familiar with our guest theology is our speed round segment. Uh, So we're just going to ask you a series of questions. And the only rule really is that it has to be, the answer has to be one sentence. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you don't think you can do that, just say pass and we'll go to the next one. Got it? Okay. Gotcha. All right. How do you define church? Define Church is the body of Christ, the body of believers who are based around the teachings and the understanding of who Christ is. All right. Uh, Are you more Arminian or Calvinist? Arminian. All right. Do you believe in a continuation of the gifts of the Spirit? Yes. Do you believe speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of baptism of the Holy Spirit? No. Uh, Do you believe in continual sanctification? Yes. What is your view of the authority of scripture and church tradition? That scripture should override church tradition. Do you practice baby baptism at your church? Uh, yes. All right. How many of these seven sacraments do you hold to, if any? Uh, baptism, uh, reconciliation, uh, confirmation. All right. Marriage. 
and holy orders. All right, awesome. Wow. Very, very good speed round. Oh, yeah, that, that, I'm impressed. I mean, definitely the smoothest one we've had in a while. And a lot of our, our Protestant guests, you know, not knocking, there's no reason for them to know, but a lot of them either just don't know what the seven sacraments are or just assume they only do Baptist and Eucharist, mm-hmm. which I've, I've thought a lot, but we're not looking to follow up questions. I always thought, you know, what, what about Mary? I'm like, oh, they probably don't. It's one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. I'm impressed, man. That was great. That was great. Uh, so, you have written two books now. What could you tell us about those? The first book is called Learn to Take Back Your Mind. And it really comes from um, Romans 8 and 28, that all things work together for the good of them that are called according to his purpose and love. And just getting people to understand that regardless of what went on in your life, that God can make it work for your testimony, your story. And I think a lot of people are afraid of their story because they're afraid they won't be accepted. They're afraid that their story is too ugly. And just really getting people to understand that that's your testimony, that's your story. And eventually that will become your ministry when people know your story. And then the second book is How the West Was Whitewashed. And it's really a historical book bringing out the minorities that were out West and the stories that got lost in transition or because uh, so many in the minorities could not write their own stories and their stories were kind of taken from them and changed into various movies and TV shows that people didn't even realize this was based on an African-American or a Hispanic American story. Mm-hmm. So uh, what led to your decision to write these two books? The, the first book was kind of pushed out of me. I have um, a famous author that goes to our church and she was like, you know, all of your sermons are our stories and they need to be uh, written down so that people can get encouragement from them. And then the second book uh, came about as I was writing my paper for my master's program. And I was like, you know what, this may be some history that other people need to hear as well. Right. That's awesome. That is something that like people who aren't in upper academia will probably never realize. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So trying to figure out how to, how to word this question. Um, why, why a history book? I mean, I, I know you're a pastor, but do you have any particular specialist interest in history? Or um... yes, I'm, I, I study. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a social studies teacher, sixth grade social studies teacher, and so when I went back to get my master's in history. Um, because the Bible is really, when you look at it, it's a history book that shows us how we got to the place where we are now. And so um, I always loved history and, and really wanted to be a teacher and teach it. And so that's what kind of got me to write in this book was like, hey, you know, if this is a missing part of history, then it needs to be talked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. I mean, that's powerful, especially, um, I mean, you picked a great year to, <laughs> year to release it too, man. It's, uh, it's something I think we need this year. You know, it's um, not a picking one side or another, just uh, hey, guys, this is our history. We want to talk about bringing significance to things. We want to talk about, you know, both sides want to argue their side of history when it comes to anything involving race. So it's really great to just have a resource that says, here's what the history actually is. Mm -hmm. And just say, hey, y'all, you know, do what you will with this. This is the facts. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Yes, sir. Because people get so detached from uh, from that kind of history uh like most people don't know rosa parks died in 2005 really yeah yeah I didn't like, it that. wasn't that long ago that this no. time like rosa parks probably saw shrek one i mean not probably <laughs> but she could have watched it and 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 a, and a lot of people don't realize that Rosa Parks wasn't the first African American woman to sit down on the bus, but actually it was a teenage girl by the name of Claudette, Claudette Covington. And the reason why her story was never told because she was a young, pregnant teenage um, girl, and Rosa Parks was a married woman who was the secretary in the NAACP. So her image was a whole lot better to lead the movement than Claudette Covington's. Mm-hmm. Wow! And Claudette Covington is actually uh, a South Carolina. <laughs> Man, right. A good yeah. South Carolinian folk, you know. Y'all may have just convinced me to get on reading this book. And, and it's not a very long <laughs> book. I, I was actually, I was checking it out. It's only, what, 60 pages, 66 six, pages? 66 pages, yes. Yeah, man, that sounds worth it. It's, uh, okay. I always loved history, too. I, I Right now I'm working through a different book about a history of uh, Cumberland Island, just a place mm-hmm. I like to camp at. So it might be a little bit more relevant to read your book. I'll, I'll have to check it out, man. So, um. You're like, like you said, your church is really involved with the community and especially, you know, just you yourself running the What's Up Rock Hill teaching at one of the locals middle schools, I guess, sixth grade middle school. So 
what do you believe that being involved in the community in this way has helped your church or yourself be more united with the churches in the area? Yes, sir. I think that when churches start working together, then we start seeing a lot of things that we use to separate us are not important. Because when you're working in the community, nobody cares if you're a bishop, reverend, doctor, pastor, evangelist. When you're working in the community, nobody cares if you uh, believe in baptism or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nobody cares for some of the things that we use to divide ourselves in the community. That's not important. What's important is, are you showing the love of Christ? What's important is, do you have a proactive attitude? What's important is, are you involved in the government of your city? And these things are important to the community. I think when more churches come together and see that, they're going to start saying, you know what? It's not about if you're Methodist, if I'm Baptist, or I'm uh, I'm uh, Church of God in Christ. We can really come together and have a big impact as the body of Christ. Awesome. So you know, it's always hard to take all of the, the great things you do and like measure them against one another. But if you had to, uh, what would you say the most important thing your church does is? Um, the most important thing our church does is probably our, um, our community cleanups, going out into the community and beautifying them. And then we go to city council. The city council gave us signs and asked us where we want to put the signs. And the signs were developed by me along with the mayor's wife. And these signs are all around the community that says, please do not litter in our community. And from that, we've seen so many communities are clean because these signs are almost like the American flag. It is a symbol of this neighborhood saying, hey, we want our neighborhood to be kept clean. And I think that was one of the most important things that our church, is, our church has done. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. It's always cool to like feel the effect you have in the community. Because like if you've ever cleaned your room and then like noticed like you feel better afterwards. That's right. <laughs> Imagine that, but it's way bigger. <laughs> it's basically like that. Yeah. Yeah. We got to do a beach sweep once when I went to ECW. It was really cool. Yeah. Then it's, um, yeah. Do you have any, any good stories? I, you know, just kind of get a little sidetracked. But any good stories about um, other churches that have come along with you guys while you were doing some of these works? Oh, yeah. We, we partner with a lot of different churches on community events. Uh, one time we did a community cleanup um, and really we only had about two weeks to get it planned because I'm kind of ADHD. And so when I get a hot idea, I'm ready to run with it. Um, yeah. And I think that will end up being a working to my advantage. But we were able to get about 30 churches involved, sororities, fraternities, and we had over 400 people. And I said, we're only going to commit an hour and 30 minutes. And from that hour and 30 minutes, we had over 200 bags of trash. Wow. picked up from the community. And so it was very church. I said, you know, wear your church, um, wear your church shirt, let people know where you go, where you're from, because we want people to understand this is an important thing. And we mix kind of the churches up with each other. So that it looked like an army of different believers going out. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a great accomplishment. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Love to hear that. Yeah. We had um, one, one of our previous guests, uh, Pastor Ryan Green, one of, one of my favorite suggestions. We always, at the end, we're going to ask you later on what we think uh, would be a practical way to engender unity. And uh, what, what he used to do is like, yeah, when we do these kind of mission outlets like this, like, what about not wearing your church shirt and just representing Jesus and everybody right. representing Jesus together? I'm like, man, that's, it's such a just, I love, I love hearing stuff like that. You know, when the church is in action, we don't have time to sit around and argue about, well, I think that God's elect means this, or I think it means, you know, you know what? How about we're saved and let's do God's work? Exactly. <laughs> That's great stuff, man. What would you say, sorry, I'm <laughs> just moving on here. What would you say is the most, the greatest stumbling block for unity in the whole church today? I think the greatest stumbling block is that no one wants to sit down and listen. Everybody wants to talk and be right. Like you alluded to early in the program that that uh, if we ever listen to each other, we'll find out that we're not as different as we think. Mm -hmm. I think growing up in, in the African-American race, you think you're the only ones that's dealing with struggles. And so you sit down with someone who is Caucasian and realize, wait a minute, uh, Caucasians treat Caucasians the same way that Blacks treat Blacks. Oh, my goodness. This is an eye opening experience. If, if the Baptist ever sat down with the Methodist or the Church of God in Christ and said, you know what, our doctrine is on the back burner. Let's see what we can agree on in the scriptures, because I'm sure we agree on way more than we disagree on, because if we disagree on everything, then we couldn't call ourselves saints. 
and, and be of the same uh, be of the same religion or the same beliefs. So I'm sure we probably believe in more things than we want to admit to, but nobody's really ready to listen. Hi everyone, uh, just wanted to take a quick break to tell you all the ways you can help keep this show going. The Whole Church Podcast, your favorite church unity podcast. Follow us on social media. You can share this episode on your own social media. Subscribe to our newsletter by emailing us at thewholechurch at gmail.com. Subscribe to our show at your favorite podcast provider, whatever that may be. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts and support us on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast. Remember, every dollar counts. Especially that last one. <laughs> you say that about all of them, DJ. It's true every time. So yeah. Let's get back to the show. And so what can we do to overcome that? I think I think we start off by building partnerships outside of our denominations and outside of our comfort zones. I, I think we start the next mission or the next partnership needs to be with someone that may not think 100% like you do in order to get it done. Because one thing that the community is waiting on, the community is waiting on answers. And if we're too busy arguing over how to get it done, it's almost like when Jesus came down from the mountain of transfiguration and the disciples were arguing with the Pharisees and Sadducees on how to heal the young boy. And the more they're arguing, the, the, the boy still is not getting healed. And finally, Jesus went and cast a demon out of the boy. And I think a lot of times we're arguing while our neighborhoods are still struggling. And I think this is important in the body of Christ that whatever hurts you should hurt me. It shouldn't be because I'm I'm not white or you're not black that these issues don't affect us. But if my brother uh, Joshua is suffering and that's my brother in Christ, then I also ought to feel that pain. And I think that sometimes we don't try to feel each other's pain. That's one thing that Jesus did that was so beneficial. He felt the Sumerian woman's pain. He felt the blind man's pain. He felt their pain. And because he felt that pain, he was able to minister to their needs. Mm. Mm. That empathy, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, and honestly, it's one of those things that doesn't happen a lot because it's, it's really, it's, no one wants to feel pain, right? So that's, I, I think it's something that the church ignores because, well, maybe not the church, but some people in the church ignore because it's, you know, you don't want to feel pain. Why, why would I want to feel that? It's easier to ignore it. Or, or, put a, or put a Band-Aid on it. You know, yeah. you, everybody, everybody thinks if I give groceries out that I'm dealing with your pain, but what if the groceries is not my pain? Right. You know, and, and so sometimes we put Band-Aids on things not to really listen and, and get down to the issue. Right. I mean, if you put a Band-Aid on a cut that might not be very large, but it's, you know, like two centimeters deep, that's not going to be great for the cut, you know. It'll still help, but it won't solve the issue. That's right. So uh, are there any Bible verses that you believe speak to the situation, that to this situation that you can share with us? Um, I'm always a fan of, um, of, of Psalms 34. It says, uh, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continuously be in my mouth. I think too many times that we complain and we don't give God enough praise or thank God for what's being done in our lives. I heard a lot of people at the beginning of 2020 talk about, oh my God, 2020 is a year of vision. 2020 is a year of vision. And I told our church, I said, you know what? We need to have 2015 vision because 2015 vision allows you to see the lines that's holding up the letters, whereas only 2020 vision allows you to see the letters. I said, if you can see that invisible line that's holding up the letters, Letters, then you understand how God is holding you up no matter what this year brings. And sure enough, this year brought COVID and a lot of people who had 2020 vision started getting quiet. Whereas our people were prepared, hey, this is a time of strategizing. This is time to finish your book. This is time to launch a podcast. This is time to do some things that you couldn't do when the world was busy because now you're getting the attention of the world. And so I tell everybody everywhere I go to bless the Lord at all times. Let his praises continue to be out, your, out, of, your, out of your mouth because if you can praise God even in the time of such a corona, what are you going to do when it's over? Wow. Yeah. Well, and, you know, even to speak to the whole 2020 vision thing, you know, you got to think when, when you see the clearest is when things slow down. Exactly. Someone just gotta just remember to let things slow down. You know, just stop trying to fight what God's doing. You know, you might not like that what God's doing is using a worldwide pandemic, but you know what? God can do what He wants. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but before we start wrapping up, I I mentioned earlier I listened to um, one of your Facebook videos, which your church. Uh, Ah, I hate to admit this. I, I can't remember the name. What, what's the name of your church again? Sanctuary of Life Outreach Center, or also known as the Solo Center. Solo Center, okay. See, I knew the Solo Center 
series on it. That's where I was like, yeah, that's the videos I watch. Y'all have phenomenal presence on Facebook and um, I'm, I'm sure you do other social medias, but I, I'm really impressed by by some of the videos and stuff. You know, a lot of churches have stuff so that they can check off that they did it, but a lot of churches put a lot of commitment into making quality stuff. So I'm really impressed with what you've been doing. And um, this last video, the one that I, I just listened to, you were talking about um, the cave. Is it, It's Abdullah, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, with uh, David. Uh, could you just maybe share with our audience just just a thing or two about what you've been talking about and uh, just kind of speak life to them? All right. We've been talking for the last four weeks on the power of rejection. And a lot of times we don't like the word rejection. We think that rejection means you're not doing something right. We think that rejection means that we're not good enough. And so when we're rejected, we don't look at it really as opportunities. And then when we when we've been discussing David's life all the way from when he was first rejected as king to when he was rejected as a warrior to when he was rejected as a person that could not defeat uh, Goliath to when he was rejected by Saul. And then on last week, we talked about uh, the rejection that led him to the cave of Abdullah. And the cave of Abdullah was not the refuge for David, but it was the place where David was supposed to be able to go and strategize his next move while God was doing what he was doing. And sometimes we have to go to a cave of strategy while we let, allow God to work out the kinks and the straight, straighten out some ropes in our lives. And a lot of people think that when they're rejected, it means that God has not for, that God has forgotten about them instead of God will allow people to reject you. So he gets the full glory for what he's about to do in your life. And I am so thankful for the series because a lot of our people realize now you may be the first one to do the most impactful, the greatest things within your family. So if you can take that rejection, allow God to move in such a way that it ends up promoting who you're going to be in the long run. Yeah. It's awesome stuff. Awesome word. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for your time, man. And uh, as we start to wrap up, you know, I mentioned it earlier. One, one thing we like to ask every guest that we have on is just if you had to give a single practical, tangible thing that our audience could go do right now that would help better maintain unity in the church. You know, something that, you know, they could put this podcast down, walk away and just do it. What would it be? I, I would say something as simple as mailing a card to a pastor that you don't know and encouraging them. Hey, thank you for being faithful during this pandemic would do great wonders. Um, um, simply uh, volunteering at an organization. Um, I know a lot of people talk about uh, during the election, they were talking about the difference between abortion and non-abortion. Um, but our, our church volunteers at the teen pregnancy center to encourage these women. Hey, keep these, ba- keep the baby. Hey, let us show you some practical ways to be able to raise your baby and help them along the way. So a lot of times it's simply by moving and and being involved in things that really motivates unity within our community. And there are tons of things that can be done that don't have to be restarted. I always tell our congregation, don't reinvent the wheel. If someone is doing something great and you see it, and that's why we started the What's Up Rock Hill page. If this person right here is holding a back to school drive, whether in your church saying they have to do one too, hey, let's get involved and bring all of our instruments together so that we can have the biggest back to school drive in Rock Hill without everybody duplicating the same idea. I would tell your listeners to simply just find out what's going on in your community and get involved with what's going on in your community. Awesome. So what what do you think we would see change if everyone did that? They just mailed a card to a pastor they don't know. I, I think I think that would and and, and and I think that would have blessed that pastor number one, but also I think that it would show that pastor, hey, not just the people of your congregation care about what you're doing and see what you're doing, and from that I think that pastor would uh, want to move to a church that encourages him or her in the midst of what's going on in this pandemic, because a lot of times the pastors are the loneliest ones because this is the first time we've ever had to pastor in a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So uh, you heard it here first. Everyone, please send C.T. Kirk a card thanking him for his service immediately. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I love yeah. all of those ideas. A man. bunch of other pastors, too. Yeah. 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 Just go buy a stack of letters. Thank you cards. You know, they, they come to thank you guys. They send like to yeah. sell you like a pack of like 20. Mm-hmm. Just find you know, 20 pastors. Make sure you include Pastor C.T. here and you're good to go. Right. All right. So what? Uh, Thank you for your time. Uh, the first thing we like to do in our outro uh, to wrap up the show is we like to do our God moment segment. And, you know, it's just the segment where we talk about what God has done in our lives recently, uh, whether it be a challenge or a blessing or uh, somewhere in between there. 
And uh, I always like to make Josh go first because uh, it's entertaining. No other reason. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is just something dumb. <laughs> but uh, this week, I took $20 cash out for the week because I, I go to this little gas station near where I work and they charge you 25 cents to use a card. Just no matter how much you buy. So I'm like, you know, just use cash because it's so close to work. And it's so much cheaper than everything else that it's literally just inconvenient not to at this point. So I did that just for myself kind of thing. But um, yeah, I thought. But uh, I showed the cash and the guy the guy works. Like, Whoa, man, you finally did it. Like, yeah, I finally did it, man. And uh, every day this week, you know, I have having full conversations with this guy just just because, you know, I started bringing cash and he opened up and then I opened up and uh able to kind of share something with him about God and what, you know, what I'll, I do. Yeah. I don't know. It was, it was cool. Awesome. So, uh, so my God moment, uh, of, you know, my God in the segment, we, that's not related to this, but we used to call the God moment segment of the week. We don't do that anymore. But, uh, so mine <laughs> is, I spend a good amount of time on YouTube, just, you know, absorbing content, you know, so there's something going on. But uh, one of the ads I've been getting recently is an entire sermon from a Methodist church. <laughs> it's a 45-minute YouTube ad, and it's That's incredible. Absurd. I haven't watched the whole thing, uh, but, you know, usually I'll watch a couple minutes. And it's, uh, I think it's, it, one, I think it's really funny <laughs> that it's the whole sermon. But uh, it's also really cool. To think that, like, you know, if one percent of the people who see that ad watch the whole thing, that's still going to be a sizable number of people hearing the word of God from a church that they don't attend, and I think that's a pretty good thing. Yeah, it's awesome. especially from a Methodist church, which is like pretty out there compared to like a Protestant church. So, like. Being in their sermon can be really high open for someone. I think that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, Pastor CT, uh, has God been any? Has, <laughs> Pastor CT, has God been up to anything with you recently, man? Um, um, all the time. Um, I think that the, the God moment was definitely um, this young man who came to volunteer. We were doing renovations. We we're doing renovations at our church. We just purchased a new building. And um, this young man was at the house of one of our members and we were talking about the Lord and talking about what we had to do as far as renovation. And he was like, can I go? And when he came to do the renovations, it just happened to be uh, in a portion of the church where I do our live feeds until we're actually able to get into it. And he was just talking about how much the service blessed him and how much he was honored just by being able to partake uh, in what we're doing in the renovation. And so uh, definitely he's going to be coming back and we were able to minister to him and share the Lord with him. And so sometimes it just takes meeting people where they are, allowing people to volunteer to help you out. And then from that, you can let your light so shine. Awesome. 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 And then uh, before, before we end the show, which, uh, you know, we have one thing we like to do after the show for just our patrons. But before we do end the show, uh, Pastor CT, where all, where all could they find you? Where can they find your books and all the other many things you do? Okay, uh, the book is available. The new book is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, and then you can find me on Facebook, CT Kirk Author Page. Um, my personal Facebook page is kind of packed up. And so, yes, uh, CT Kirk Author Page. You can get on. We talk. We can laugh. And um, also, our church airs every Sunday at 11 a.m. on Sanctuary Life Outreach Center page. Awesome. Very cool. All right, so uh, everyone go check that out. Uh, you know, go over to Barnes and Noble, pick up C.T. Kirk's new book, uh, which I will probably be doing. Yeah, uh, sounds interesting. So, some future guests we're going to have on the podcast. We're going to have Eric Nevins of the Christian Podcast Association, uh, Pastor Tim Register, uh, Caroline Harris of the A Couple of Folk Podcast, and of course, at the end of the season, we're going to have Francis Chan. Wow. Mm-hmm. Does he know? No. Wow. Great. If he does know, he's being pretty rude <laughs> <laughs> by not agreeing to be on. <laughs> but hey, uh, yeah. we'll see. All right, well, thanks everybody for listening and uh, head on up for Patreon for the rest. <laughs>